So shall we start by asking you, Mark, to make the case for what we call Big Bag Days, please? Good morning. Uh, I think the first thing is to actually define what is Big Bags. So the phrase is thrown around as though it has relevance, meaning, definition. I have absolutely no idea what a big bag is. We should not look at bags uh, on their own. So in other words, we should not say a set limits. We should not say 100 is acceptable, 150 is acceptable or not acceptable, 200 is or isn't. Where is that definition? It's what you define yourself. So that might be the same as we define other things. People have a completely different. Some people think that two weeks holiday is fine. Others think that four weeks holiday is much preferable. Some people think that they won't have dinner without having three courses. Others think the one course. Some people think that a bottle of wine is fine. Others that a glass. We should get away from setting limits because what we have in a puritanical way of saying 10 pheasants is great and 20 is wrong, that's a definition which is fatuous and means nothing and actually is self-destructive. I think the, the food um, analogy is a really interesting one because there is a perception that shooting is gluttonous and we need to do everything that we can to get away from that. I think I have the real privilege of spending quite a lot of time with people who don't like shooting and you know big bags it's a really reductive thing to talk about I think Mark would agree but it is something that they go on about they go on about people not taking birds home uh, burying birds if it happens I mean I think you know there are instances of it having happened over the past sort of decade every once in a while but that is something that sticks um, and we need to do everything we possibly can to show people that we are harvesting birds in a sustainable way and not that we are out there in a gluttonous way uh, just just banging away and, and sort of in a way that birds become targets. All right, Mark, Mark, before you go, Roger, could we have a word from you, please? What do, what do you think? Could, could you just settle something between them? Just get, get to these two closer together if you can. Yeah, well, I, I think we're very fortunate in Britain that we have a tremendous diversity of shooting opportunities from going and shooting one duck on a flight pond to enjoying a, a big bag day. So you're um, on Mark's so, side. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, you know, we're fortunate here that we've got that diversity but I mean I don't think it's big bags that are ruining the sector and will bring an end to our activities it's bad practice that will bring an end to what we do but the two are not the two are not different things so 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 historically that, that was, uh, the historically right. historically you know big bags and bigger and bigger bags and bad practice have been related things right i think everybody would agree with that no you would agree with that Mark. um not necessarily okay, patrick Ma because Mark, we've Mark, got go, go to roger finish your point sorry yeah so um there's Lots of examples of big shoots that are doing great work. Lots of examples of small shoots that are doing great work. But bad practice, if it does occur, it's not related to the size of the shoot. It's related to how that particular shoot is run. So why is everybody criticising you, Mark? No, I, Roger always talks sense. Um, I've known him for a long time and his view is pragmatic. The fact is that you can not take birds home from a 50 bird day and not properly handle them, distribute them, and they go into the human food chain. You can do the same on a 250 bird day. So the size of the bag, it does increase the responsibility on the organizers to properly handle it, but it doesn't mean that you can't handle it and deal with it properly. So I don't accept that. The other thing that we have to understand is that the size of bags have overall reduced. We are not seeing bigger and bigger bags. We're actually seeing smaller and smaller bags. From, from when? When do they start reducing? Do you do in the last 10 years? Yes. Um, the size of the bags, if you talk to pretty well all the shoots and all the sporting agents, overall bag sizes have reduced. They reduced up until the last couple of years, and this year they are reducing again. Very significant overall average reduction this year. So the idea that we're on a curve going up is not true. We're actually on a downward curve. But do you welcome that, Mark? Yes. 
So, so you, despite defending big bags, you are happy to see the size of bags go down? I, I'm not. I think, uh, Charlie, you're, you're mistaken. I'm not defending big bags. I want a definition of what a big bag is before I get into the argument. You know, if, if 150 or 200, and to some people, they will have lovely shooting and they will go and shoot 15, 20, 25, 30 birds a day. Now, they, yeah, I mean, to I, them, they I will. Think th in many sorry, ways, hold on. It's, it's to not, to it's, them, yeah. they will then think two hundred birds a day is a big bag. I think, in some ways, it's quite a boring topic of conversation, and it's not actually the question that we should be asking. Speak for yourself, right? So, well, and you ask me every year, will you talk about bags again, bag sizes? Uh, I think what shoots need to be doing is they need to be looking at themselves and saying, "Am I doing something positive in terms of conservation?" Okay, so what if somebody is the, came, what is the Patrick, conservation if somebody came story? to you, if somebody yeah. said to you, I, "I have the best possible best practice shoot in the world," and we're knocking down 800 a day, yeah. would you be happy with that? Well, I'd say there are, there are questions that need to be asked. Can you actually sell those birds? I mean, you know, we are shooting more birds really than we can sell. The game market isn't working. And it, then I think there are interesting questions around, would it be useful, I'm sure it would, to go around where that shoot happens and say, you know, do you find yourself running over birds on the road? You know, you know how does this shoot look from the outside? So there's a perception thing and there's a conservation thing but just saying you know is 250 big is 300 big it's a, it's a sort of boring question shall, shall that you we, can go around just, and round just on. ask the audience very quickly who here believes that big bags are going to have an effect on public perceptions about shooting negative effects quite a lot of you who here believes that it's irrelevant that the numbers don't matter at all yeah, just a couple. OK, so the, <laughs> the world is with you, Patrick, in many ways. Always, always. <laughs> All right. Um, Roger, best practice uh, is, is our way out or a limit on the numbers we shoot? I think uh, what shoots need to be able to do, every shoot, large or small, needs to be able to demonstrate that they are delivering a, a net biodiversity gain. So by running a shoot, is there more biodiversity on there than the what than there would be if there was no shoot? And if the answer is yes, then I would suggest that that shoot is run sustainably and is justifiable. And that might be a small shoot, it might be a big shoot. But the, the economics of, of putting back into the habitat and the countryside is much easier to do on a bigger than it is on a smaller shoot. That is a fact of life. There is more money to spend, which you can spend, on improving the environment, improving the habitat, improving biodiversity. So therefore, we shouldn't. That's one of the reasons, as Roger says, we should not be blanketly saying big is bad. In terms, it's also personal, perhaps, do I think that 800 birds a day is a day that I would either A, want to sell, or B, want to participate in? The answer is no, that is my view. I think it is, it's more birds than I would want to have, and I don't see, I don't think justification is the right word. I think it's, it's just a big day, and it's probably too big a day. But I can't tell you whether 250 is right or 300 is right, because that seems to me to be very much in the personal preference realm. Well, you, do, you have just set a limit. So what, so what is your limit, personally? No, I haven't set a limit. I've, well, said, said, 800 is too I've big. said what I would want to do. And I don't, that doesn't, is not something, it's not a size of a day I would want to do. I well, think, I think there's, a, there's another really interesting point here, which is that if you speak to old keepers, people like Lindsay Waddell, um, people like the former head keeper at Hilborough, they will say to you that they don't actually think that shooting should be a business. And I think, you know, you're saying that the, the sort of bigger the bag, the more you can spend on conservation. There are lots of shoots where they're not making any money out of the shoot, but they're doing tremendous things. So Arundel would be one, Hilborough would be one. And, you know, I'd be interested, Mark, to, to know whether, you know, do you think that actually looking at shooting as a business has been wholly for the good or has been in, in some ways a problematic thing? I think you're in the wrong place to say that because it looks to me as though this is very much a game fair which has shooting at its core and there's an awful lot of businesses around it. So I think to think that shooting is not a business is, a, with the respect, game, the, is pretty naive. The game fair when it started, uh, you know, shooting wasn't commercial in the way it was and I believe then that the game fair was, a, was very much a thriving thing. So, you know, I don't think that the game well, fair thriving and, and selling big bags are, are sort of connected. You, you cited estates, Patrick, who, who, you know, who have a reasonable amount of money to start with. I mean, let, 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 us, let us take, uh, you know, the, the, the new government contention that the, the land has to, has to wash 
its face. Yeah, uh, if yeah. shooting is one of the ways it does that, what's the problem? Well, I think there's a misconception that, you know, <laughs> Arundel can do wonderful things, but only Arundel can do wonderful things. I mean, you'll meet farmers in Suffolk who are on 300 acres, on 400 acres, who are running shoots that aren't commercial in any way, who are doing their own little bit. Um, I don't think it's just the case that sort of the big boys are the answer in terms of conservation and, you know... Mark, make the case can... for... No, business. with respect, that is absolute rubbish. The, the, the fact is that... So you think lots... small no, areas no, 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 can't no, no. do anything in terms no, of conservation? Lots and lots of small areas do fantastic things, but... Saying small is good and big is bad is just an out ridiculous over But I don't think that's what I said. No. I don't think that's yes, what I said. Yes, you did. Was you're, you're when, also, when did I say that? No, sorry. Hold on. You're also suggesting that someone, because two people happen to have got one in a family in the state of Norfolk and one in Sussex who are very rich landowners, you quote that, that example as being good. There are very good commercial shoots, whatever commercial would be. I can see someone in the audience in front of us now who runs what you might describe as a commercial shoot, but that's part of the economy of a farming and shooting estate. Is that bad? No, I don't think that running no, a think commercial I it shoot... I think you're is, having an argument with yourself here. Is, no, I'm certainly not. Is a bad thing. The fact of life is you can have good shoots which are smaller, you can have good shoots which are medium size, and good shoots which are bigger, and the contribution that they make is relevant, uh, is dependent upon how they're run. Roger, before you, before you come back, Roger, the GWCT has to be the arbiter here, doesn't it? What, what do you say? What, how, how do you judge uh, on, on size, if at all? Yeah, well, I mean, again, I, mean, I don't want to be boring and repeat the same point I made before, but if you can demonstrate that you're delivering good things for the environment, then I think size is irrelevant. Is it and impossible to deliver good things for the environment if you're doing an 800-bird day? Um, it depends how many 800 bird days you're doing over the course of the season, doesn't it? If you're doing one of them, um, then yes. But if you're doing mul that multiple times... And how many shoots achieve, do one 800 well, bird day a season? Well, in that order to model? achieve that, you've got to put an enormous amount, a number of birds down. So, I mean, it probably wouldn't be appropriate if you were doing lots of it. Hmm. But um, so net biodiversity gain is absolutely fundamental here. But again, going back to one of my earlier points around we're very fortunate here in Britain to have this diet diversity of approaches and shooting opportunities and I think we need to maintain that. Um, we all like um, small days, some of us like you know quite big so, days. So you, you've, you've, you're not being tough on big bags, you're being tough on the causes of big bags, is, is that how you're, you're um, looking at it? I think so, yes, and the potential consequences of, of that, because to have lots of big bag days, then you've got to release lots of birds, all right. and that is perhaps more of the issue than the big bag, is the number of birds. Can I, can I move the discussion on to the, the perception again? Patrick, as editor of Shooting Times, one of the things that worries me about condemning stuff generally, whatever it is, but this is one of the hot topics which people can condemn is that you're saying everything I do and above is fine and everything that I condemn should be made illegal and 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 you're setting a bar and that and that is a very much a uh, is something we've discovered from social media is something that people do are you at risk of doing that no, I, I think the point of being a magazine editor, I mean, you know, we've got a guy in this room who writes for Shooting Times uh, who very much dislikes somebody else I've just taken on at Shooting Times as a columnist. So, you know, the point is we don't, point them out. we don't have a, we don't, you know, we don't have a kind of party line. And I okay. think when you do that as an editor, it's, it's, a, it's a mistake. Um, but, but I think perception is a very big thing. And I think, you know, Roger's saying, isn't it wonderful? We've got this diversity. You have people who go off wild fowling and you have people who shoot 800 bird days every Saturday. I think, you know, shooting could be sort of, you know, Icarus-like. And if we grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, the whole thing could go pop. And the poor guy who's only ever been shooting, you know, one duck, uh, you know, every, every, every month might find that, you know, his sport goes because of something that had absolutely nothing to do with him. So I think, there's a, I think there is something there that we need to, to think about. Mark, you're looking cross and shaking your head. How many shoots shoot 800 birds every Saturday? I've been in the job now, I'm 70 years old. I first went shooting when I was eight. I've been involved in it work-wise for 46 years, which with respect is a lot longer than some other people on the panel. And I think I have a pretty good knowledge of the shoots up and down the country. Are there some big shoots? Yes. But do they form the majority of our sport? No, they don't. No, but do they endanger 
the people who are just getting on and doing quiet little things themselves. I, I, think, I think, yes, I think you have to be mad to think otherwise. I mean, you know, I, I have the privilege that Mark doesn't have of, of spending time with people who really dislike shooting. So, you know, for example, on Dartmoor, there were 3,000 people who went to Cornwood uh, to protest um, the wild camping ban. You and weren't one of them, were you? I, I, I wasn't protesting. I was there in a journalistic capacity. I don't think Mark... You might have been there. There were a lot of people there. I didn't see that. Um, but, you know, all they went on about was big bags and people burying birds and people not well, they, taking they, birds they home. They said that, and they're yeah, not yeah. shooters. Uh, they dislike shooting, and that's what they particularly And they're going in on... Because I, I've not heard the antis worried about big bags particularly. I oh, hear, I hear there, shooters yeah. worried I'll show about you, it. No, no, no. I, I, could show you the, I could show you the placards. You know, that was, that was the theme. Is that something they've been told to say by their bosses? Or did, they know, did they know to think that before no, they I went I along? I, I don't know. I was just quietly there, just scribbling away. I wasn't sort of pressing people. Um... But I think it's really important to go and to listen to people who dislike shooting and to listen to what it is that they're saying. Because, you know, we are in an echo chamber here. You can say, oh, they don't care about that. They don't say that. I'm telling you that they, that they do. I do not believe. I think that... I'll take you with me next time. Oh, we sorry. can go. Next no, time I go, I'll take you with you. The vast majority of people who object to shooting do it on principle. They object to shooting. And they don't think that shooting 50 is good and shooting 200 is bad. I, I, if you've met those people, then you are in a slightly different place to me because I haven't. I've met an awful lot of people, and because I have a, perhaps a bigger business range than you have, I meet an awful lot of people who come into our shop, who buy country clothing, all sorts of boots and all sorts of clothing, who don't shoot. And people who, in the main, that I've spoken to who don't like shooting, don't like shooting. It, they don't like killing, and the, de think, the size uh, yeah. of the bag doesn't seem to make I hear, much I difference. I hear you, but you know, I, I had dinner last summer with uh, Mark Avery, who uh, wasn't here a couple of years ago, but almost was, who I think you, know, you sort of have come across over the years. Uh, and he said to me, what are you doing next week? I said, next week I'm going up to the Isle of Lewis. We're going to walk up a few woodcock uh, and shoot grouse over a badly behaved Gordon Setter. And he said, I'd have absolutely no problem with that at all. You know, I think we tell ourselves that people who don't like shooting don't like shooting wholesale. I think it's not... I mean, we've he, got an yeah, article... He, Patrick, he's a slightly partial voice. I, I asked we, him... This, we've got an article coming up in Shooting Times, and I set out to find those who hate shooting the most, and I said to them, what would your perfect shoot day look like? Uh, Chris Packham was one of them. Mark Avery was another one. There's a big anti-grouse shooting campaigner. Uh, Chris Packham said that, you know, muntjac stalking wasn't a problem for him. The idea that people just don't like shooting wholesale, I don't think it's true. No, I think they, those, those three are quite specific. Ruth, Mark and Chris sitting on the bird fair stage. And, and, and everybody who was there at Cornwood, they, the 3,000 they, they, they put their hands up to say they support walked up days and they don't support commercial shooting. And I asked the 600 people in the audience and they all said the opposite. So I think they, those mm. three are, try, are trying to spin you a line a bit. Yeah, I mean, they do have influence. They don't, have some influence. They? It didn't I seem mean, to work on the 600 people is. in front of them. Um, Mark, uh, as the uh, grandfather of uh, shooting, as you appear to have uh, cast yourself, uh, what can you do in the business of shooting to make sure that, your, that other shoots like you tow the line? I think um, standards are absolutely essential, and I do think that. Um, and we, that's probably something that we, we took for granted until maybe 10 years ago, and we realize now that our standards have to be better and better. They have to be better for the environment, they have to be better for sustainability, they have to be better because we're dealing with a food product. They have to be better all round, and that is, that's been a, a real driver by the GWCT and shoots are latching onto it, perhaps not, some of them not quick enough, and we need to do everything we possibly can to do that. Patrick, that, that is a, a point. I mean, convictions for raptor persecution are almost nil now from a, a high point 20 years ago, and yet the RSPB are still hitting us over the head with that one. And this is widening the, the, the debate a little bit, little bit further than just big bags, but it is true to say that the RSPB characterised the commercial shoots as being the biggest sinners in that area because of the commercial returns they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So that, tell, me about, tell me about the perceptions there. What, what should we do? I think that the RSPB have a real role to play, actually, in talking to their... So I think they, they you know, I very happily say it, they, they exploit that situation, they exploit the situation as was. Uh, I think there are a lot of people at the RSPB who do tremendous things, and there are people I know who shoot, who volunteer with the RSPB. Uh, I was talking to one of them last week who's just started writing for Shooting Times. Um, I think the, you know, they make hay out of the notion of division. 
uh, and, and they have a responsibility, I think, to, to bring people. You know, we don't have time for division now in terms of conservation, and they could play a real role in bringing people together. Roger, the GWCC is very much in a front line against the RSPB, especially on soft topics like raptor persecution. Is the direction of travel the wider persecution of shoots? Is, is that what you see? Well, actually, um, Charlie, we, we collaborate with the RSPB on lots of different projects in the uplands the right and in the lowlands. So, um, I mean, but shooting is an easy target, and we um, continually shoot ourselves in the foot. The vast majority of shoots are delivering really good things for nature, um, but the isolated cases of bad practice or illegal practice, illegal killing of raptors, um, uh, the stories we hear about birds being dumped. Um, uh, shoots not using code compliant fox snares, these sorts of things, um, which are you know, isolated cases, they hit the headlines and they detract and mask from the vast amount of good work that's going on in the countryside. So, um, yes, it's, I agree with Mark, it's about standards and being able to demonstrate that as an individual shoot, you're doing good things for the environment. That's the, the way we can have a sustainable um, shooting sector going forwards. I find the stuff that the RSPB puts out hard to believe because gamekeepers will lose their shotgun certificates if they're caught. So why would they do it? If they don't have their shotgun and firearm certificates, they won't be able to work. Uh, and the RSPB is putting out this line that they're constantly risking their gun certificates to persecute raptors, to, to bury birds, to trap illegally. Uh, so do you, do you believe what the RSPB says? Who's that to? You. Um, uh, sounds like you do. I mean, it, so it sounds to me like you, you accept what they say that shoots... Um, what are you referring what, to what, specifically? What, what, yeah, I mean, because you're what, just saying, you know, the RSPB said, I mean, what? Like, that well, the RSPB has brought of... out the, you know, the raptor report, the raptor persecution report for 2023, saying that raptor persecution is at a height at the same time as the graft of, for raptor persecution convictions are at a low point. Yeah. So how... Are we just being taken in by the conservation industry over this one? Or, or is there something to worry about? No, I mean, I, I don't think we've been taken in by um, anybody. Um, but it is a fact that there are um, proven isolated incidents of illegal killing of raptors or um, other bad practice. And we just need to stamp that out. And there, there, if we can, then game management as a force for good for nature conservation will, have, will be a lot more of a credible argument and a case for uh, the wider conservation sector. So this is the bit I don't see. I, I don't see these raptor persecution cases taking place with the regularity that I think I'm, I'm getting from you. I, I, I see them occasionally taking place, but, but not regularly, whereas 20 years ago they were taking place no, I, regularly. I absolutely agree with you. Um, it isn't regular. It is isolated cases. What can the commercial shoots do to increase the speed of change of culture so that there are zero cases of bad practice. Well, I think you said something then which rather identifies the problem with the question. Um, you're assuming that big bags only occurs with commercial shoots. Good point, yes. Uh, I would say that if I was a very rich man and had a big shoot and I was rich enough to have a private shoot, I would then have whatever size of days I wanted. Um, commercially, I can tell you that the it is because it is very, very, very hard indeed. I would, I mean, Dylan's in the audience, I can see Will from ours in the audience, so there's one or two sporting agents. Um, I think our biggest day this year booked is not bigger than 400, and we have less than a handful of 400 days in the whole of the William Powell sporting moment. Roxton's will have more because they're bigger, but the majority of days sold this coming year will be somewhere between 150 and 350. That will be the majority of the trade. So the idea that we're concentrating on big bags is, you know, that is, it may have been, but it isn't the case now. 
not in the real world. It may be still in a journalistic world, but it ain't in the real world. OK, Patrick, perception... Was that the question? I don't think that was the question, but... Or, it's an right, interesting but, answer, isn't it? Do, do, do you accept that things are getting better, Patrick? Is well, it, what's getting... We've kind of... Yeah, the question you asked and the answers are slightly... What, what's the question? OK, well, you, well, the question to you... I mean, I'm, I'm, putting you, I'm putting you in charge of perception. I'm putting Mark in charge of the industry, and I'm, I'm making uh, Roger right, the right. voice of reason here. So if you're in charge of perception, is the perception improving? I think we need to think carefully about the way that the world is changing beyond us. So we can't just carry on doing the things that we've always done because the world is evolving. So, you know, there was somebody just saying to me in the, in the audience that, you know, is it time that gamekeepers stop being called gamekeepers? I think in one sense that would be very sad, but I see what they're saying. And I think that's kind of getting ahead of the game, right? Um, so that's what I think we constantly have to be doing, is we constantly have to be on the front foot and stop being reactive. I mean, what happened with United Utilities, I don't know if people are aware of that, but a huge amount of uh, grouse shooting has just gone because of the decision that was taken there. They felt that was the right decision because of public perception. They felt that you know they were going to be getting heat because they were uh, allowing grouse shooting to happen on their ground. Uh, and, and, and if that is the case, something is clearly wrong because, you know, we can jump up and down about that and say how awful that is, but, but in the court of public perception there, we have just lost. So, you know, where did we go wrong and how can we evolve and how can we change and how can we look ahead? So answer that question, how can we? Right, if we just answer that question, right. a new chief executive came in who did not think it was the policy should be of United Utilities to have shooting per se, not limited to grouse shooting. Yeah. That's the first But why did she the think second, that? Just hold That's on. The, just, I was answering my question, on. but yeah. I'll answer it for you because I'll probably do it better. <laughs> now, the reality is we've just seen a chief executive of one of the big four banks um, bef uh, decide to leave for doing things wrong. There is no reason why someone who comes in to make a decision, that's a right decision. That just happens but to you're be on a decision. Bit of a, you're on a bit of a ramble now. I'm no, asking no, no, you, why do you think? I'm, what I'm saying, saying is that, that the, the new chief executive we'll took a view that United Utilities did not want to renew shooting leases. That was their decision. And they've carried it through. But let, but let, on, let's on, on, but, but let's analyse that. Quick. Why? Why do you think she took that decision? Because she did not think that it was something they wanted to be allied with. Yeah, you just keep... But, but why? That's the question. You don't seem to be able to go beyond that. I want a little bit of analysis. I want a little I, bit... I of... don't know, because I didn't make the decision. Well, that, that, could be, that could be the problem, OK? So that's what we need to think about. Why is it that she thinks that they will get heat from the public if they allow shooting to continue? It's a perception issue. On the Roger. broader point of are we moving in a direction towards um, uh, a, a more sustainable model for shooting, I believe, yes, we are. Because the COVID pandemic and then the issues around bird flu last year has, has um, resulted in a lot of shoots re-evaluating the whole approach. And uh, within the advisory service at GWT, we, we're contacted on a daily basis for, um, uh, for help from shoots and advice um, on, on how they can have a resilient shoot going forward. And a lot of them are starting to think about how they can encourage more wild birds in the bag. Um, uh, can they move away from a price per bird model to a price per day model and, and, to, and to have a shoot day that's not judged on numbers of days shot and more taking into account um, other factors. So I believe, yes, we are moving towards a more sustainable approach and, and the inquiries that we get suggest that that is indeed the case. All right, Patrick, will that change the perception? Of you? You've posed the question that we need to change the perception. Will that, will that do it? No, I think, I think there's a lot of sort of head in the sand stuff going on here. Um, you know, why is shooting not a good look for sort of the business businesses at large? You know, why do businesses feel that the public don't like shooting, and what can we actually do to change that? We need to kind of go deeper. Okay, well, you I want you to answer that question. How, how? What do we need to do? Well, I think you. Know, I'm going to name him now. I think what Dylan said uh, to me just before this about moving away from, you know, we probably need to do some pretty radical things. Is it time that we stop using the word gamekeepers? You know, is it time that we made a lot more noise about the things that we do in terms of conservation? I think it is. We have I been making quite a lot of noise about that for quite a long time, and it doesn't you know, seem to work. Is it time we stop having arguments with people like Chris Packham and we sort of, you know, stop he, he, being so he antagonistic? Wants close, he wants to close Mark down. That, that is his mission. You know, it's going to be very difficult to, just not having the arguments with Chris Packham is not going to stop Chris Packham. 
uh, no, but but I think it's being cleverer uh, than we're than we're being, and I think it's looking at looking ahead, and it's being less antagonistic. All right, Mark, being cleverer and being less antagonistic. I don't. You have to realise that with some opponents, you're never going to win. You're never going to change their view. And Avery Pack and Dingy, etc., you are not going to change the Dulu, and it's delusional to think you are. The problem with shooting is it involves, other than clays, killing things. And we, you cannot get away with that. And in the world that we live in, unfortunately, we have moved a very long way from the agrarian society. We're in a completely different world now, and killing things is not acceptable except to eat and the dichotomy of that for very many people, and that is the problem that we have to live with. Sounds you like, can't sounds like have you're shooting your without it. Sounds like you, you're, you're, you're resigning. I mean, you, you're, not. you're not. You're not saying that this is the end for shooting. No, I'm explaining why we have a problem convincing the public about game shooting. That is a fundamental problem. You so, can't get away from it. All right. Could I just say very quickly that you're not going to be Chris Packham, you're not going to persuade him that shooting is a good thing. But in constantly arguing with the guy, you might persuade the middle ground that actually you're not the good guys that you're trying to portray yourselves as being. And that's the thing that we need to understand. So we, should, we should just keep quiet and, and listen to what he says. Yeah, we shouldn't pick sort of silly arguments to, to try and grow our viewer figures. I, I'm a be master nice, of you know. picking silly arguments yeah, with Chris Packham. That's, that's what I do. <laughs> Roger, uh, is, is, is that, um, should we, should we, Shut up about it and, and, and carry on and hope that things improve, or, or should we get on the front foot? No, we should absolutely get on the front foot. And again, it goes back to this point about demonstrating that we're doing good things, but being able to demonstrate it properly and have the proof that we're doing it well. All right. Absolutely right. That is, there is no alternative. That is a negative view. That's the right view. Patrick, would you, uh, would you would like to join their ranks? Well, I'm not sure what I, I'm not sure what Mark is sort of projecting onto me as my view being. You know, I would like shooting to thrive. I would like shooting to to, to still be here in a hundred years' time. And we need to be doing the right things in order for that to happen. And thinking about public perception is a very important part of that. And 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 just saying, I think that you know, the public dislikes shooting holes. I don't think that's the, you know. Okay. We need to find the middle ground. Get to the middle ground. Speak to the middle ground. Okay, just uh, Mark. Can I can I ask you? Is is there a difference in the public's minds between wild bird shooting and and shooting where you put down? It's, I, it's basically I, all the same thing. Grouse or pheasant? It's the same. It, it's a generalisation, but I don't believe there is much uh, separation out. I think killing things is whether it's wild or reared. Um, I think the scale has some. I don't think it it has. It doesn't change people from disliking shooting, but it causes other problems. But I think fundamentally, if you don't agree with shooting and killing things, you don't agree with shooting. OK, Roger, the social licence seems to me to be the biggest problem. If I walked down my local street in Taunton 30 years ago and said I was going to go to a shopping centre out of town, there would be a bit of an ooh, because they'd only just built it. And if I said I was going to go shooting at the weekend, they would go ooh, because they quite like the idea. If I do the same thing now, the shopping centre would get an ooh, because it's normal, and the going shooting at the weekend might get an ooh, because it's, it's against the social licence. Is, is that the needle we need to, to move? Yeah, well, I mean, Mark's point about um, people that um, don't like shooting can't be educated and um, informed into the benefits that that can create in terms of the environmental benefits, the social benefits as well, but also in terms of producing a healthy meat. I, I mean, I, I, I think there's a lot we can do there. And I personally, I know several people, friends that were vegetarians, um, now they eat game meat because they understand the process and the, um, and the knock-on benefits that that can create. So I think there's a lot we can do in terms of education. Are we already doing it? I mean, you know, we've got the Country Food Trust turning uh, game meat into food for food banks. We, 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 we do an enormous amount of work to promote game meat. We do an enormous amount of work to promote the conservation benefits of shooting. We just don't seem to be making headway with that argument in the media. Uh, well, I, I, I take issue with that, Teddy. I think we are making headway in, in, in the media. There's lots of good promotional campaigns around game. Uh, of course, we need to do an enormous amount more. But um, I think it's a slightly negative view to say that we haven't, we're not making progress. I think we are. Well, it's, it's been, you know, 30 years. And we, don't seem to have, we seem to have moved backwards since I've been working and shooting uh, rather than forwards, even though we've been doing all these things. Can I, can I, ask, can I ask you, Patrick? Uh, 
how would you, as, as a young person, even there's a little spot of grey hair I noticed, but apart from that, a young person, how would you make shooting cool? How would I make shooting cool? Um, I don't know, I think people are genuinely very interested in sustainable living at the moment, you know, and people are very interested in eating things like venison. This is what Roger um, said about vegetarians who eat game. Yeah, exactly, exactly the point. So I think, I think the more we can do uh, to, to sort of harness that, I think, is, is, is where we've got to be. This is very big in Germany at the moment, you know, the I am a vegetarian and I hunt. That, in Germany? Yes, it's, 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 it's a thing there. Oh, okay, yeah. I, yeah we I we don't know. talk about it so much. We're, we're going to be talking two people today on the stage of the Game Fair Theatre about... But I, genu I genuinely think that is... Uh, and I, I think, you know, <clears throat> there is a thing that if you want to get into stalking deer or whatever, it's quite a hard thing to do. And, you know, what can we do to make shooting more accessible? Uh, you know, I think, I, think, I think we could do a lot more to do that. Mark, your clients who have shoots, uh, how, how many of them are saying to you things like, well, I, I'm going to carry on shooting, but I need to rewild part of my estate to make my land ownership acceptable at my dinner parties? Probably... Not less, exactly that, but you know what I mean. Less than 10% at the moment. Still about 10%, though. I mean, that, that many people are, are looking at the kind of extension of virtue alternatives to shooting. Well, if you think that the, the driver, economic driver, is uh, from subsidy, as we used to call it, is in that direction, that is probably in the major reason why. So it's, it's, it's a carbon credits money maker, really. Okay. Um, do you think more and more people are going to be saying that kind of thing? I mean, we, we talked about uh, Arundel, you know, a wonderful wild bird shoot, but there's no question that they might be in the market for doing a NEP, doing a NEP castle and going completely green. Yeah, I think the majority is going to be economically driven because agriculture is not that profitable. Um, so, uh, if the economic driver is going green, is going carbon, then I think yes, we will be. We will see more. So, could shooting price itself out of its own market? Is that a possibility? It will have an effect on shooting. That's definitely the case. But we probably need to look back. Shooting has changed massively over the last 40 or 50 years. You know, it's regressed in terms of size over the last three years because of COVID and the economics and, and bird flu. But we've seen a phenomenal increase in, in the demand and supply of game shooting over the last 30, 40 years from what it was when I first started. Um, and the, the one thing that always happens, change is a constant factor in, it's an evolutionary factor. So we will see changes in shooting as we've seen changes in almost everything. And we, you know, when you get old, then we look back and think it's not as good as it used to be. That's just a, an older person's habit. The fact is that, that those changes could be very advantageous. They could be smaller and m more shoots less formal shoots, more opportunities for young people to come into shooting. But those changes are evolutionary and we should accept them. Roger. I, I see some real opportunities for um, landowners in particular to create some incredible habitat through um, uh, natural capital projects that will be fantastic for game and wildlife. So, for example, um, uh, many landowners have been put off planting new woodlands in the last few years because the economic incentives haven't been there. Through a natural capital project, you might be able to plant that new woodland spinny that you've been wanting to do for years and years, haven't had the resource to do so. So, um, yeah, natural capital, which is coming down the line, um, biodiversity net gain, mandatory from November this year. I see some real opportunities for, uh, for game management. We're going to be talking about this with our hosts here at the Game Fair Theatre with Carter Jonas later on this morning. But Roger, do you, do you see rewilding and shooting working hand in hand? Is that something that could possibly happen? Yeah, well, it depends how we define rewilding, doesn't it? I mean, rewilding, you could be taking vast tracts of land out of agricultural production. What we're more interested in is how you can rewild very small areas of farm by creating habitat and, and managing that alongside a productive agricultural environment. That's what most landowners are interested in. And again, that's entirely compatible with game and wildlife management objectives. Well, we know that, but if you take the Revive brochure, Revive being the, one of the organisations in Scotland committed to getting rid of shooting, on the front of it they have a grouse moor with a patchwork of burnt heather 
uh, and butts. On the back of it, they have uh, some low-level shrub that I would call a fire risk. Uh, I look at the front and I say that is a perfect rewilded estate. It's got, uh, it's got areas of burning, it's got regrowth, it's got lots of ground nesting birds. We have 75% of the world's heather here in the UK. On the back, I, I see problems. Uh, and yet they are clearly committed to the back page of their, of their catalogue, of their brochure. That's where they want to be. And that seems to be not to work alongside shooting, Roger. I think that, well, that pack, back page, though, is a vision, isn't it? It's not proven. That front page is a proven way of managing that landscape to deliver fantastic outcomes for breeding waders, for example. Yeah, we know that, but I said that to Ruth. Is this not the perfect rewilding project, the front page for your catalogue? And she looked at me and said, are you joking? You know, that is, that is not what she wants to hear. We, there is, there is, Patrick, this is probably one for you as our token ante on the stage, you know. Surely we will, we will never be able to meet these people halfway on this one. When Chris Packham wrote his manifesto for shooting, it effectively had Mark giving up his business and, and stopping shooting. How, how are we going to make this work? How, how are we going to get uh, shooting working in front of that audience? I, I mean, I was just thinking about all those parts of the country that wouldn't have woodland or wouldn't have ponds or whatever if it wasn't for shooting. And then I was actually just thinking about, you know, maybe the woodcock that would live in the habitat on the back page of the Revive campaign's brochure. You know, I think, um, you know, shooting and rewilding very much go go hand in hand. Um, and I think, you know, that's another thing is how, how do we get on the front foot and how do we start talking about that? So, you know, I think shooting is often perceived as being kind of anti-rewilding, but actually, you know, you've got keepers who are doing things all over the place that other people would call rewilding. So maybe it's a battle that we don't have to have in the way that some people think we might. Is it just a language question? Do we just need to change the language surrounding shooting, like re rebadging gamekeepers? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think rewilding is a stick that is used to beat people with, and it's sort of used to beat the shooting community with, but actually there are lots of people who, you know, do things who are in the shooting community that very much are rewilding. I'm sure people who you employ do things that would constitute rewilding in another person's mind. Mark, make the case for why, why Mark Osborne is the country's foremost rewilder. <laughs> I think it is a term which is abused with a lot of people not understanding what it is. I manage two estates in Scotland next door to owned the next door estates are owned by someone who is the biggest rewilder. I see almost no economic activity locally from rewilding on scale. Um, I can tell you exactly what my two clients put into the local economy in terms of employment, in terms of local services, and I can tell you reasonably accurately what happens on those next door estates where there is no significant benefit or no real benefit to the local economy and that in, the, in a rural area is very important. I think the sort of rewilding, mass rewilding is not suitable when we have an increasing world population and I believe food is going to be an increasingly short uh, product in times to come. We saw it when Russia invaded Ukraine. That had a dramatic change. I talked to the minister that he said that the major change in DEFRA the day that the Russians invaded Ukraine and suddenly they appreciated what the effect of that would be on food supply in the whole of the rest of the world. So I think when we go mass rewilding we need to be really conscious of that. That's completely different to what Roger and I would think um, and possibly Patrick as well, lots of opportunities for more conservation focused on farms and estates up and down the country. The landowners and farmers have done a bloody good job over the years. Bear in mind that lots of them have had to be influenced because it's not that profitable by government direction, and that's gone round like a yo-yo. But you look, they would like to see more conservation, more input into the habitat, and we've got that opportunities coming up now. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. But just uh, th that is an interesting point. Landowners and farmers have done a bloody good job over the years, which is not something we hear very often. Um, can I ask you, Patrick, whether you agree with that? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think there's this thing at the moment that sort of you know farmers are enemies of conservation, and I think you know there are 
places where that is true, but that's not true wholesale, you know, and, and, and farmers being bashed in the way they are. Um, I think it's very interesting at the moment with the, with the, the right to roam movement. Um, so there's this idea that, you know, footfall isn't the enemy of biodiversity, that farming is the enemy of biodiversity. And look, it, to say that that's wrong would be simplistic, but to say that that's completely right would also be simplistic. Um, you know, there are areas where nature has been pushed right to the edge, and the people who are ensuring that it doesn't get pushed over the edge are the farmers and keepers who are on that ground, and having people on that ground could be a thing that pushes it over the edge, just to sort of develop that. It does so seem that, to me that the conservation industry would like to stamp out three species from our uplands, the grouse, the sheep, and the, uh, and the gamekeeper. Uh, the, the, the deer, the sheep, and the gamekeeper. I mean, that 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 is at odds with what we're talking about here. Uh, if they get their way, if the conservation industry replaces the landowner in the UK, which is, you know, a possible long-term outcome, then that, that is not going to go so well for any of us, any at any level, let alone just shooting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know there are species that don't have long enough left for us just to go completely hands off you know that's it, it sort of might in some parallel universe result in a kind of ecologically balanced landscape one day but that's not gonna you know i mean we saw um guy shrubsole the other day going down to arundel and smashing up larson trap who guy shrubsole is a big right to roam campaigner and uh he said that he did that because you know in an ecologically balanced world you wouldn't need larson traps and the keeper down there was saying he would also like to live in a world where you don't need Larson traps, but we don't live in an ecologically balanced world. And perhaps if he does his job well, you know, we might have more ecological balance than we do now. But smashing up Larson traps is like, it's not going to... Well, not perhaps we should thank Guy for doing that job, because he, <laughs> he introduced the topic to the media. Um, Roger, back to you. Um, I, I'm worried about the... the we, we're talking up the, the benefits of the landowner and the farmer at the moment. I'm worried about the long-term future of the landowner and the farmer. I mean, this is just... This is going beyond big bags and beyond shooting but I, I cannot see that they are going to survive an onslaught against the conservation industry that believes they can do it better and believes they can replace them. Yeah so well, the government has set legally binding targets this year for nature recovery so by 2030 nature recovery should be halted. Um, over 70% of the British landscape is agricultural land. The only way we can possibly reach those legally binding nature recovery targets are by proactively working with the farming community. So government needs to support that, uh, but also as well with what's coming down the line with private sector investment, um, it's farmland that will be, be delivering those nature recovery um, improvements. And game management is obviously related to all, all that as well. So. Um, we talk to a lot of farmers about natural capital and rewilding and um, if, you're a, if you're a farmer, they, they tend not to be that interested in, in rewilding projects per se. What they are interested in is opportunities to create more habitat on their farms alongside their productive farmed environment. Well, and they're that, realists, aren't they? They're realists, exactly. Uh, and they uh, presumably are interested in carbon credits and money from that if they can get it? Very much so. Yes, OK. So, so it, is, it, is, it is driven by government. But if we have a government that, is, that is, is pushing this change from a traditional security of 10-year British situation, from a traditional landowning situation to a countryside that is basically run by the conservation industry for the public good, then where does shooting have a place? No, I, I, I take issue with that, Charlie. I, I, I don't see a trajectory whereby um, the conservation industry is um, you know, setting the agenda on um, delivering nature recovery. It's the land management community, the practitioners, that are setting the agenda. OK, a practical question to you, Mark, if I may. Um, five years' time, what sort of days do you reckon you'll be selling if the current trajectory keeps going? Uh, I believe that shooting, game shooting, has a good future. I genuinely believe that. Um, I think it will change, just as it's changed, as I said, over the last 30 or 40 years, and has changed before. Constant change. Um, where it goes to, I suspect we will see quite a lot of shoots which, in the last 20 or 30 years, have become bigger, 
um, actually relook at the economics, if they are commercial, at the economics of what they're doing and whether that really makes financial sense. And some of those will decide it doesn't and will then look at a different model. And that, that model may be opening up more opportunities for people to have rough shoots and for people to a wider number of people to enjoy shooting in the countryside. But there will still be individuals or commercial organisations who want to have a bigger shoot and will have formal driven game shooting. And, I, and there will be others who will perhaps go more wild and they will want to encourage um, and will see some of the opportunities in the current systems of financial support from government to help them go wild. So we'll have that diversity and that's what we should have. We should have a wide range of different approaches, different sizes, different objectives. Will that ch well, how will you change the charging structure for shooting? Interesting, and I suspect that we will have some changes over the next few years. I don't can, think they're can, yet format. Could you, could you give us some of the options, some of the possibilities that, that those could come from? Well, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because how it occurred that you charged for the per bird, which is the majority of days are sold on that, it's, there's a lot of logic why, but there's a lot of reasons why not. And we may actually get much more rather like fishing. You, I don't think I know anywhere that charges by the fish. Obviously, if they did on salmon fishing in the UK, that perhaps would be a fairly cheap day. Um, but we may get to the fact that you go and take a day and it's X. And the expectation is you get a range of between X and Y birds, but there's no guarantee, and that's it. Would that be a good thing? There'd be a lot of arguments to say yes, it would. But I, you know, I think that's going to come through and will evolve. Patrick, can we have your prediction for what shooting will look like in five years' time? Yeah, I would agree with Mark almost entirely. I think on that. Um, that's a joy to hear. Well done. Uh, I was going to give you. A... Um, I think I think you'll probably have a lot of kind of mid-tier shoot tenants who pack it in because it just doesn't pay for them anymore. A lot of them are, already are. Oh yeah, I mean it's a, yeah, a, an ongoing thing. So I think what's going to be really interesting, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day who was saying that a shoot tenant had taken half the ground they'd taken the year before and they were sort of, you know, wondering whether anybody would actually be interested in taking that ground on as rough shooting. You know what I mean? So I think um, I think that's really interesting. Are we going to see like small syndicates, rough syndicates coming back onto ground that they were on 20, 30, 40 years ago and then got cleared off of? You know, I think that'll be interesting. I also think the role of the gamekeeper, I was talking to Dylan about a, a, a business venture that he's, uh, I'm sure I'm sure this is now sort of in the, uh, of, of finding, you know, because there are gamekeepers who are out of jobs. The United Utilities ground will see a lot of keepers out of jobs. You know, with Elms, you've got to have people who are doing that heavy lifting essentially and you don't just have you know people on the ground in the way you did so who's who are, you know who's going to lay the hedges right who's going to restore ponds who's going to restore wetland um so i think i think the future will be very different and could be could be bright in some in some ways what's your job going to be like in five years time roger are you going to have to drop the word game from game and wildlife conservation trust um, well, you know, we, we, we do have these regular discussions about you know, how we can have a, um, a title for the organisation that best reflects um, what we do. So, yeah, I mean, things evolve, don't they? But um, where I would like us to be in five years' time is um, have harnessed um, all that tremendous knowledge in terms of the good work that's being undertaken by game managers, wildlife managers, call them what you will and and that that information that data um, that evidence base being um, taken seriously and um, being considered to be credible evidence by government uh, so recognition of what they're doing as being good uh, for the environment um, and so we we want to do a lot more work with game managers we call them practitioners and 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 Bit to be able to use that data a lot more um, effectively. Um, but go, I just wanted to just touch on Mark's point about, I'm really encouraged to hear Mark talk about um, a, a move towards um, uh, a, a more diverse way of um, charging for a shoot day. And if we can move away from that price per bird model, then we are then naturally taking a shift away from 
big bags. I also think the quality thing there is really interesting. I think like Holcomb, they do like the Holcomb Experience Day or whatever. Um, you know, and the quality is what everybody, you know what I mean? If, that, if that's how days are sold, then people start to think about other, you know, things. Would you like to see a, a per day charge, Roger, if, for, for commercial shooting? I would, absolutely, yeah. I would. Yes. Mark, do you think that you will be able to sell rough days to corporate shooters? Is that something they could possibly... Now, the reason people go corporate shooting is because it's, you know, a fabulous boys' day out or boys' and girls' day out, uh, and, and, and the rough shoot is a different proposition, isn't it? Yeah. Um, constant change. If you think in corporate hospitality now what you can sell, what people want to do, compared to 20 and 30 years ago. You would never, I mean, when we set up our corporate hospitality company, I think in, I don't know what it was, 1990, I would never think the things that people would want to experience now, then. Do I think that people will want to go rough shooting? I can't see why not. There'll be a whole lot of younger people who will look at it and think, right, that's a way I'd like to go out. It's physical, it's maybe demanding, depending on the countryside. I go with my mates. Yeah, I, I can't see why not. So the pricing is the tricky bit, because we're talking about running the economics of difficult parts of the countryside. Down in the West Country, where I live, we have our first simulated game weekend, where packages start at £15,000 for the weekend, uh, which is uh, punchy. Uh, but apparently they're selling. Uh, you're not going to hit the kind of £30,000 for eight guns, including accommodation, that you are currently likely to be getting for big shoots, though, if all you're offering is a walked-up day, unless you change the game completely, aren't you? But, but every market, most markets, have uh, a lower part of that market, a middle and a higher. That's the way that trade works. So we would sell days now where people will shoot... Um, 70 or 80 birds and we will sell days up as i said to 400 but we have got you know almost no uh, of those days now we're not selling very many 70 or 80 bird days sorry that's wrong we will correct me we've actually got we sell one place in scotland where our days are between 30 and 50 and we took that on and started that shoot last year was our first year i mean is that viable or is that is, uh, is yeah, that it's a really interesting one that, that part of the driver of that is because it's a very long winter, it's a grass moor with some low ground, and the keepers are really, they spend a whole lot of the winter seeing no one. By having the low ground shoot, a small low ground shoot, it's not suited for driven game shooting. Um, by having that, we then have day shooting, the keepers meet people, it becomes much more social, it's much better for the environment, the lodge has people staying in it, we therefore have people cooking, etc, etc, all good stuff. Okay, well I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you've kind of come to this point, this, this was the sort of, this was the, the chat which was going to be about how bad things are. And, and I think we've reached a point where, although change is coming, if they're right, it's not necessarily something we need to be afraid of. So, ladies and gentlemen, please can I thank Roger Drake, Mark Osborne and Patrick Galbraith. Thank you very much.